Hey, Mauro, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Awesome. Well, it's uh, great to have you on the show, and I'm excited to dive in to all things cerebral spinal fluid. I know some people listening may have heard the word before, maybe you haven't. And so maybe to really ground the conversation, what is cerebral spinal fluid? Yeah, so just to, in the words that you're using, cerebrospinal fluid, it's a fluid that essentially bathes the cerebrum, which is the head, uh, the brain, and the spine. Um, and so not many people are aware that we have a, a, a clear fluid uh, that's in the middle of our brain. It's housed in these cavities in the middle of our brain called ventricles, um, and it bathes the outside of our brain. Um, and it goes all the way down the, the what's called the central canal of the spinal cord. Uh, so imagine the spinal cord being uh, having a hollow tube uh, all the way down until it ends and it, and it tapers off uh, at the end of the spinal cord. Um, so you have a hollow tube in the middle of your spinal cord, and that's also filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And the cerebrospinal fluid also bathes the outside of your spinal cord. Uh, and there's a pool of cerebrospinal fluid that comes down all the way down to your all the way down to your sacrum. Um, so even though your uh, spine, um, your spinal cord ends at lumbar vertebrae two, um, your cerebrospinal fluid goes actually all the way down to your sacrum. So just kind of keeping that in mind of you know right now when we're sitting, if you're sitting and you're sitting on your sacrum, you're sitting on sort of a fluid. Like a like a like a little fluid lake uh, down at the bottom, uh, and so that's that's essentially what the cerebrospinal fluid is. It's a clear fluid that bathes the inside and outside of our brain, uh, and we have these cavities and this central canal uh, in the middle of our brain and spinal cord that this fluid is bathed in. Now, there's been a lot of interesting research that's come out over the past couple of years that helps maybe point us to what this fluid might be responsible for and how it might impact consciousness. And maybe it would be helpful if you could share kind of some of those findings and what has you so interested in studying it? Yeah, so I became interested in, uh, in studying it. So I did my PhD on the cerebrospinal fluid um, and really on the changes of the cerebrospinal fluid in brain development, uh, in, in embryonic uh, development, and then how it changed into uh, adulthood. And when I started the, these studies, there was very little known about the cerebrospinal fluid. We thought that it was essentially a, a buffer. If you could imagine um, a fluid buffer between your brain and your spinal and, 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 your, and your skull, so that if you kind of jolted your head around or got hit, that there was this sort of fluid that was buffering the brain and kind of protecting it. That's kind of what we thought that the cerebrospinal fluid did. Um, we, we, we knew that it had some um, like hormones and, and, you know, electrolytes in it. So essentially it was providing some sort of fluid nourishment, let's say, to the, to the brain. But we didn't really have a good idea of, um, of, of, of its function. And um, when I was in the lab, Essentially, what we started doing is we started looking at the cerebrospinal fluid, mostly because what I realized is, you know, when we grow tissues uh, in the lab, we're always growing them with fluid around them. So we're adding some sort of medium to provide nutrition, to provide information to the cells or the tissue to either, you know, to develop, to, to stay alive, uh, whatever it might be. And in the lab I was in, uh, they studied a lot of brain development and everybody was focused on the actual brain tissue itself, which is a really important part to study. But since I was, you know, I was going into the lab and I was changing the fluid every, you know, every two, three days or every day. And when I was looking at some of these uh, embryologic structures, what I noticed is that there was actually more fluid than there was cells. And that mm -hmm. when we were developing, when, 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 when mammals develop, when we develop, even uh, vertebrates and vertebrates um, that we develop in a in, in in a pool of fluid. We develop in 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 fluid, and when we're really tiny embryos, we have, there's actually more fluid around us than there are cells. Um, and so, to me, that was very interesting. It was sort of like, wow, what is what information is this fluid providing 
to the cells that is helping guide its survival or development? And that was just the first question is, does this fluid provide any information or is it just sort of like a support network, right? Where it's just so like, well, we need to grow in fluid. And so therefore we are in fluid. But if you just kind of think about it, right, we are, our, our entire body plan is actually um, created and designed in a fluid bed. Like we are bathed in fluid. Our first cells are all bathed in fluid. And as we come out of it, you know, as, 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 as fetuses in our mother's womb or in the amniotic fluid, uh, as our brain is developed, um, all of the, am the, the amniotic fluid actually becomes the cerebrospinal fluid inside the brain. And all the cells that give rise to our central nervous system are all bathed in this fluid. And so we just simply wanted to ask, you know, what are the what what are the molecules in this fluid and does it provide any sort of information to the developing brain in terms of instructions? And what we found is that the fluid is very dynamic. It changes day to day, especially in the embryo, as 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 the embryo needs certain nutrients or or you know, or or the brain is developing in different ways, the fluid is actually able to provide those instructions to the stem cells of our central nervous system that give rise to all the other cells of our brain and spinal cord. So imagine, right, if you were, imagine like the developing brain as, you know, let's just say the coast of California, and you wanted to affect the entire coast of California. Well, well, there's a couple of ways of maybe doing it. Maybe you can take an airplane and, you know, spray something on top, or you could just drop something in, in, in the ocean and let the ocean bathe the coast of California. Mm. And that's kind of what the cerebrospinal fluid does in a way is if something gets into the fluid instantaneously, it has access to all the, all the neural stem cells of the developing brain. And so can provide this information in a very uniform, regulated pattern to the developing brain. And so what we found is that it does change dramatically from day to day in the embryo. Um, that it really changes when you become uh, an adult. You don't need all the uh, essential growth factors that are present in the embryo to help support brain growth. Um, and that a lot of the cells that are still stem cells in the human are actually in, in the adult are actually still making contact with the cerebrospinal fluid. So it provides a niche, a sort of environmental niche that helps cells retain their sort of stem cellness that helps them retain their their ability to differentiate and proliferate into other cells um, but it's also providing uh, guiding cues to, uh, to to brain development uh, if any areas of the brain are injured it can actually help sort of redirect where new neurons are going um, so it has a number of of, of, of various functions one of the biggest functions that was recently discovered um, starting in about 2013 or so was uh, essentially that we thought that the cerebrospinal fluid was housed in these ventricles, right? Just like what I said, primarily housed in these ventricles. And we thought that there was a big separation between the ventricles and the brain tissue itself. But imagine that uh, what we found in our analysis was, and I called it, you know, sort of like the liquid crystalline matrix, because what I noticed in the analysis was actually that it had a lot of extracellular matrix proteins. And what the extracellular matrix is, is it's exactly that. It's a matrix uh, that is around the cells that sort of helps, um, helps keep all the cells together. And when you look at some of those proteins in the extracellular matrix, um, what we noticed is that a lot of those proteins were actually in the fluid itself. So it was sort of like a, a less differentiated extracellular matrix. So initially we thought, oh, wow, well, there's got to be some sort of communication here between the brain tissue that has all this extracellular matrix fluid and the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and so in 2013, what they found was actually that um, that during states of, of, of sleep, and this was first done in rodents and then confirmed in, in, in humans, was that during sleep, there is a pulsing nature of this cerebrospinal fluid that goes 
uh, from the ventricles actually into the brain tissue itself. And we never, nobody ever thought that that would happen from going actually into the ventricles to the brain tissue itself. And, and what, it, what, what it helps do is actually clean the brain tissue throughout that of toxins that build up throughout the day, for instance. And so uh, imagine that this was the first time, right, 2013, where somebody showed the importance of sleep. It took us, um, you know, so many years <clears throat> of trying to figure out why is sleep important. We knew it had cognitive effects, like, you know, it was the same as, you know, if you had something like, you know, if you didn't sleep for 36 hours, it was the same as a certain number of alcoholic drinks on impairment of driving and stuff like that. They had done a lot of those studies. But we didn't really understand the importance of sleep. What did it actually do? How did it regenerate? And this was actually one of the first studies that showed that this uh, sleep uh, changes the way that the ventricles house the, the cerebrospinal fluid, sort of open up these gates. People call it the glymphatic system, sort of uh, from, from, from glial cells, type, a type of cells in the brain, sort of similar to the lymphatic system in the whole body. They call it the glymphatic system sort of opens up these these gates or you know channels and 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 cerebrospinal fluid can now flow into the brain tissue and you get this sort of pulsatile flow of cerebrospinal fluid into the brain tissue during sleep and what that does is it actually cleans out the toxins that occur throughout the day and now there's a lot of interest because Clearly, sleep is not the only way that you would be able to clean out these toxins. If you think of sleep maybe as a parasympathetic activity, for instance, you can just hypothesize that there are other states where these, the, these gates or channels open up and you get this sort of clearing um, of, of the brain tissue itself. And in fact, um, people have found other ways um, they've looked at, for instance, you know, ultrasound, uh, like focused ultrasound. So, so energy, uh, adding energy to the cerebrospinal fluid. They looked at um, pulsating uh, uh, lights, like a strobe. Um, they've looked at um, at breathing, um, and 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 saw that this can actually increase the the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid through this lymphatic system. Um, and so this is really interesting, right? Because if if we can get, if, if, imagine this clear sort of fluid in the middle of your spinal cord and in the middle of your brain, um, being able to transport nutrients, being able to transport growth factors, electrolytes, sugar, hormones to the brain, but also used as just like any flow of liquid, um, we want the liquid to be flowing just like a river, right? So this is sort of like the internal river of goodness inside of us. If that river dams up, then we don't get the clearing of the toxins uh, from the brain tissue. And then those toxins build up. And now there's a hypothesis that if those toxins build up, that that actually leads to things like neurodegenerative diseases, dementia, Alzheimer's, things like that. And so what we want to do is we want to try to keep this fluid flowing. And so sleep is important. And, and, and what people are starting to now study is, you know, do, do breathing exercises or, or does any way that we can actually stimulate this fluid to flow, does it actually help reduce cognitive impairment, reduce cognitive uh, decline, and reduce neurodegenerative diseases? So it's quite incredible where we've come over the last 20 years in terms of understanding this fluid. And now it has generated a huge amount of interest in terms of what are the practices that we could do, whether we're young adults or, 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 or elderly, that can actually try to stimulate this fluid, knowing that you have this river within you, that we might have the ability to consciously regulate the flow of this fluid within us through our brain tissues to help us essentially clear any toxins or debris that may have built up throughout the day, just from general use, wear and tear, thinking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's sort of like, that's sort of like one of the biggest things to, um, to, 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 to think about and moving forward with the cerebrospinal fluid is what am I doing to help get my fluid flowing 
such that I can keep my brain and cells clean and, 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 and toxin free. That's essentially what, where, where, where we have come. It's, it's incredible that such a, um, I, I, I guess not, uh, you had no idea going into this, the potential impact of this substance behind, besides just a protective barrier to it potentially being, you know, a gateway to uh, many things that lots of ancient technologies have alluded to for, for a long time. If you read, if you read, you know, things like autobiography of a yogi, you hear Yogananda essentially allude to the, the spine and the, 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 the spine being the connection to, you know, the, the divine and it, my mind can't help but go to these, these yogis who just didn't sleep. Like, well, how is that possible? You know, what were they doing? What were they aware of and tuned into that we're not? And if the function of sleep is to effectively cleanse the brain of toxins and they were just doing that all day long in meditation, then I buy why they might not need to sleep. So this is this is a very very exciting field of study and I think a, a question that I would have for you is do we know is there a marked sensory experience that we are able to discern when we are kind of the floodgates are open and the cerebral spinal fluid is is in our brain? I mean, would we know would we know that? Um, so, you know, I'm curious about what, what makes you ask the question. So, um, yes, absolutely. But various people have different sensitivities to internal sensations. And one of the things that I, that I try to teach and I try to take people through some of my, some of my, some of my courses is is actually increasing that sort of internal awareness of those subtle senses so i my on on my website for instance I, what i've tried to do um i didn't know the answer to that question i felt like it right i'm like wait some people can actually sense this flow of the cerebrospinal fluid um and so what i tried to do is i collect i tried to collect other stories of people who could actually feel it and so um, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to sort of publish a paper to say, look, we can feel this just like just like we can feel, you know, I can touch my, a pen and feel the pen. And and sometimes in, 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 you know, if you study body work, they say, you know, pluck a hair out and put it under one sheet of paper and see if you can feel the hair under one sheet of paper and then put it under two sheets of paper and see if you can feel that hair under two sheets of paper. Mm. Now put it under three sheets of paper and see how many sheets of paper then you can no longer feel the hair. And see over time, as you start developing your sense of touch by, by going to any sort of body work school or something like that, see, see if that changes over time. And I believe that that's actually a fundamental process that we should be teaching our kids and everyone as a whole is how do we, what method do we actually use of, of introspection of, of, of not only looking within, but actually um, uh, feeling our body from within, feeling, for instance, what it feels like to touch something, not from the perspective of the of the of the of the touch receptors on the finger, but from the from the perspective of the bone inside the finger or the tissue right above the bone, for instance, or even from the heart or the lungs. How do you, you know, going into, for instance, you know, just taking just taking a moment and just saying, oh, you know, um, what does my heart feel like right now? Well, you could probably feel it from the external, like, oh, it feels like there's maybe a little bit of space there, but almost as if you take your awareness and you and you actually bring it into the middle of your heart. And what does what does your heart feel like from the perspective of the heart? And if you do that. 
it's it's a more subtle sort of felt sense, and you can you can actually uh, guide yourself from one like like uh, like different areas of the heart or different areas or of, of the lungs, or you could actually sort of place yourself into a red blood cell that's clue, that's going around your heart. And so these are some of the things that that um, that I teach in some of the classes that I do is sort of, you know, going from more uh, macro level sensations to more subtle level sensations. Mm. And so I think what you're what you're describing is more of a subtle level sensation of really, really, truly feeling the cerebrospinal fluid actually moving in the ventricles or in the spinal cord. Um, we know that it happens. And um, so could people actually feel that? And what I'm getting confirmation with through myself, but, you know, I was an N of one, um, is asking more and more people is, yes, we, there's definitely an ability to sort of have this felt sense of this, the cerebrospinal fluid moving or of something moving within the cerebrospinal fluid not necessarily this fluid moving, but there's something inside of the cerebrospinal fluid that was th some sort of energetic shift within the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and that, you know, it's sort of like, you know, it, to me, it's, a, it, it, it's another way of, 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 of just shifting our perception and teaching people, how, you know, how to, how to feel in a different way. And I think that's a really, really important part. Even just asking yourself, oh, how does that feel? How does that feel within you, inside of you, right? Where do you notice that? Um, whatever it is, whether it's a sensation, an emotion, a perception, whatever that might be, how does that feel inside of you? And then, right, and then the, the, once you kind of get that, then it's sort of like, oh, now, right, bring your awareness to the cerebrospinal fluid, knowing the anatomy what does it feel like to you? Uh, and that's why I do a lot of anatomy because remember I came from in order, I came from a very sort of scientific medical perspective. And so I had completed physiology and anatomy. And so I had a very good sense of, you know, the brain, uh, the brain anatomy. And so it, it, in a way, it's sort of like, if you, if you understand if the better in my perception, the better that I had a view of the anatomy, the more I could actually navigate things and ask questions of myself and say, oh, am I up against the ventricle right now or am I still in the fluid? And, and almost kind of like allow the ventricle and the fluid to respond. But I knew the anatomy. And so if I, if I moved and went sort of to the back of the lateral ventricle, for instance, I could guide myself and feel the felt sense of that space, right? So that's why a lot of my, uh, I, I, I did a, a it's a, it, it's a, it's a awakening awareness. It's found on YouTube for free. Um, and you know, we do, we do anatomy in there. We do embryology because a lot of the felt sense sort of like to understand your embryology, to understand your anatomy. And if you have an, if you have a, a pictorial sense of that, it actually helps to navigate the physical body from an energetic perspective. Um, and so I do, you know, I do recommend sort of those sorts of practices, even initially um, before, you know, trying to do any sort of like activation or of anything or, or, you know, even, um, you know, even, 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 even altering your sense of consciousness in any way. I, well, that's really, really awesome. I didn't know you did that. And I completely agree with you that interoception or the ability to be aware of what's happening at our inner space is man it's just one of the most important technologies ever and That's um it. i i just had my first kid and i cannot as someone who's had to do so much unlayering and unarmoring because i never felt into my inner space it is going to be one of the first things I bestow upon my children. And one of the cool things that you have alluded to in that experience that has kind of come alive for me over the past couple of years is this idea that your consciousness does not need to basically be in your head. Um, it can be anywhere in your body. 
and you can kind of almost, it's almost, it's like you're kind of surfing a, uh, like a, like a, you're in a reality, right? It's like your inner territory and you can move around and focus in your heart center. And moreover, you know, that type of experience in my, my opinion is often the gateway to self-healing is learning how to communicate, communicate to the body, give the body instructions, right? Which kind of makes me, you know, wonder, like you mentioned, you know, things like breath work, light, different Act, activating practices for the cerebral spinal fluid. I wonder if, you know, merely getting in touch with the f- the fluid and its intelligence, you could just navigate it with your conscious awareness. See, I, my 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 thoughts would be yes, that you could. Like, why not? I think you nailed it. Like uh, that, you, you know, you nailed it. And so, you know, if you go to my website, that's a, it's kind of it. It doesn't say it in that words, but it's sort of like it doesn't. To me, I'm like I'm not I'm I'm not here to prove anything. All I'm all, all I want to do is I just want to say, hey, you have this clear fluid in the middle of the brain. Pay attention to it and see what happens. That's it, and have that relationship with it, just like you described, right? And 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 you said instruction, and you know what that is in my perception is start having a relationship and. The way that I would encourage people to have that relationship, even if you don't believe anything that that I'm saying or, you know, have no introception ability whatsoever, just even if you just, you know, look at your hand and know that there's bones in there and just say, you know, just say, hello, bone, right? How are you? Or hello, cerebrospinal fluid. Close your eyes, you know, just kind of like get into like a quiet place if you can and just say, just, just, just say hello to it right? How do we, how do we respond energetically, right? You reach out and you're not going to go punch somebody, right? If I want to have a relationship with you, I'm not going to punch you. Okay. So I'm not going to come at you real fast. Right. And I'm, and, and being a little back, I can be in that observant quadrant kind of witness. Well, but if I want to have a relationship with you, right, there's a bit of sort of there's a bit of, hey, I I see you. I acknowledge. Hell, hey, I just want to say hi. You know, I, I, like I don't want any like I don't want anything from you. I just want to develop this. Hi, I just want to say hi. You know, and then, right? See how. See how whatever you're doing responds, mm. and feel it. Right. It's a felt sense. It's not a mental thought. It's a felt sense. It's, oh, well, it didn't respond. Okay. Well, if you're trying to have a relationship, let's say, with something that you've never had a relationship with, do you expect it to have a response in, in the first second? Maybe not. Right. So, so, so maybe you stay there for a while. Right. It, here's this, here's this timid, here's this timid fawn coming out of the, out of a dark forest, maybe for the first time, you're not going to yell and scream, but you're not going to run away. You just, just sort of see, you know, what is it doing? And maybe for the first hundred sessions that you do, it's just there, right? And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, maybe there's a bit of intention. Maybe there's a bit of love that emanates from from you. There's a sort of a, a loving kindness that emanates out. And now there's a some sort of engagement, and it's a felt sense. It's not a thought. It's a it's a purely felt sense, and that engagement then naps the goal, right? Because now there's sort of this in it, 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 it is sort of this it, it's sort of like an energetic connection, and then that's where the relationship starts to build, and that's where I think then the instructions can come, and it's not necessarily telling it. It's more of like suggesting or asking with with some sort of intention, right? And then dropping the expectations of anything. Hey, you know, I'm wondering, what is it? You know, what is it like to pulsate there? If you, if I breathe, what what does that? How do you how do you change? What does that do? 
wondering if if you know I'm feeling a little bit of a of a headache over here. I'm wondering, you know, have you ever tried to just go there and like bathe it with fluid or love? Mm. It's, it's beautiful, man. It's right? you know, it so reminds me now of, you're having that relationship, <laughs> and from there, it in my you know, in <laughs> In my, it not only touches on your body as a whole, because you can do this with the bones. I do this with the skin and then I go to the subcutaneous tissue and then the, the fascial tissue and then the, the, you know, the muscles and then the bone. But you can also go to the, to the blood vessels, to the nerves, right? And then through the blood vessels, you can connect to your whole body. But, but, but then you can do this to all the fluids. And so what I say is, yeah, the, the cerebrospinal fluid, in my opinion, it's like, the, it's like the fluid, like you said, surfing, right? Why do you use that word? Um, um, uh, you mentioned Yogananda. Yogananda used the word, you know, uh, 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 at, at electricity. Um, I actually, I, I have the, you know, I have the, um, the spine and the brain are the altars of God. That's where electricity of God flows down into the nervous system. Okay. Um, so the, the there's this sense of like electricity. There's a sense. What does electricity do? It flows. What does um, what does what does fluid do? It flows. And so, any time that we're stagnated, that we're resistant to any sort of flow, there's probably some element of suffering that is occurring. And so, what the fluid then being in relationship with the fluid or this flow or the surfing, like you said, is you're surfing. <laughs> you're just surfing. Right. Hey, this wave was nice. That was the butt. You know, it's not you're just surfing. Right. And so you can surf. You actually surf through the fluids. And now it's not that the cerebrospinal fluid is the cerebrospinal fluid. It is. But really, now we're looking at like the fluid body. That. The molecule that was probably in your cerebrospinal fluid at one time, maybe in your extracellular matrix. In your hand right now. Or you could be peeing it out, for instance, and then that gets, you know, processed. Maybe it goes out to the ocean, who knows, and then that gets evaporated. Okay, so just imagine, right, you pee it out, that then get, goes into the ocean, and then uh, it gets hot and the ocean evaporates. And so that oxygen, that oxygen molecule that was made, that would made up a little water molecule in the middle of your brain was actually in the ocean. And then that got evaporated and made into a cloud. And then that cloud went over Colorado and rained down. And then that rain was collected in a natural spring. And now that hydrogen and oxygen molecule is actually in my bottled water that I'm drinking. So now, now it's this, it's this total interconnection of, 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 of fluid, not only in your body, but now of all, like all fluids everywhere. Um, and, 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 and so that it's sort of like, okay, here I am in my, but totally embodied, totally felt, felt sense, right? The transformations that, are, that can occur from that felt sense. But then there's this sense of like, the energy that you may feel that's slightly away from the physical body or even boundless, that's eternal, that's limitless, that has no shape or, or form or, or, or anything like that. And most people, you know, when they are in some sort of altered state, whether it's through some sort of like holotropic breath work, Wim Hof, uh, pranayama breathing or anything, do notice a shift in the perception of their body, of the boundaries of their body, right? And so uh, it's just curious to kind of see like, oh, what, you know, what, what is that? Where am I connecting into? Um, and then again, coming back to the felt sense, what is that for you as a felt sense in the body? Um, I'm not sure if that, I'm, I'm not sure if that really made sense, but um you know, I know we're talking about the cerebrospinal fluid, but it becomes the fluid, in essence, of the body, of your body, of everybody's body, of the fluid of the oceans, of the fluid of the cloud, you know, of all. And then we can get from the fluid to the elemental nature 
of all these things. And then we can go down to the to the electrons, to the neutrons, to the quarks, and et cetera, et cetera. And now you've just expanded it into into everything. Well, <laughs> so it's, it's sort of like this channel. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's a lot of kind of um ideas here that remind me of just you know this this holographic principle of the of a totality right of within one droplet there's everything um exactly and um you know i've heard you talk about the cerebral spinal fluid being potentially uh a gateway to that that oneness connection that we all we all seek like we so many of us consciously seek and others probably unconsciously um would like to feel that. And, you know, I'd be curious whether you have any particular theses of like what, why that, how those two might be connected. Yeah. Um, for sure. One is there's a lot of research going on into the properties of water per se, in terms of, um, what, what water can do in terms of holding, uh, energy that I'm really curious about and um, and and I'm following very closely and again trying to get some funding to uh, look specifically at you know what can water uh, transmit as an as a as an energy source for instance um, there have been you know people have used Bach flower remedies. Uh, I'm not sure if 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 you've ever used Bach flower remedies, um, but I have, and I was a skeptic, right? And so I come to everything as a as a pure skeptic, and I have used Bach flower remedies, and I have used um, uh, homeopathy, and you know, if you go back to like one of the first papers, really looking at home homeopathy in in immune cells, I it was published in either Science or Nature. And um, it got so much backlash because, you know, they published it and they said, um, we can't find anything. We, although we don't believe this, we can't find anything wrong with the methods. And so therefore we have to publish it. And then it kind of, and then people tried to like, you know, redo it and they weren't able to redo it. And so therefore they said that, you know, it doesn't exist, but because there was so much a priori sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, non like this can't be possible. Uh, that they that 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 a lot of people really tried to try, try to sort of smash it down. Well, there, it, there there's actually like well known data that like like over half of the studies that are actually published in peer reviewed scientific journals cannot be reproduced. And it you know maybe it's the lab environment or maybe it's the maybe it's the intention of the of the researcher or whatever. You know, um, and so, so uh, you know whether it's Bach flower remedies of of water holding a certain energetic property of, um, of 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 a plant or a flower or or whatever it might be, or homeopathy that can that can actually uh, hold a resonance, um, um, or like some of the work that Dr. Masuro Emoto did and tried to do it, Dean Raiden tried to you know do it double blind study of, you know, putting words and, and language on water bottles and or water and send it off to some neutral person and see, you know, could you tell a difference between uh, crystals that were made of that water? Um, Veda Austin has, is doing a lot of fascinating work in terms of doing this new crystallographic method of, of, of crystallizing water and seeing uh, water images um, actually appear that have that hold some sort of energy of what the water was exposed to. So mm. there's a lot of interesting research coming out uh, and, 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 and that's being done in terms of what water can, can hold and the energetic property of water. Um, not only from like a vibration perspective or a resonance perspective, but, but, but like an ener like, like an energetic memory for instance. And some of this, not that I like, I'm an expert, but people have actually told me that, you know, some of this, if you look at the movies, um, uh, 
you know, Frozen 2, for instance, people have actually written on my website about, about, you know, she's going up the river and there's this memory in the, there's this memory that's housed in the water. Um, the most recent, you know, the way of water. There's these certain allude, you know, people are alluding to water in different, in different ways, um, even, even through, uh, through, 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 you know, popular videos, maybe even giving us a message of, of, hey, you know, we should be looking at water a little bit differently. So the cerebrospinal fluid is 99% water. It's one of the, it's one of the most sort of pure water um, uh, fluids in the body. So not only, right, if you just look at it from a purely like biological scientific perspective, it's got, it's got hormones, it's got electrolytes, it's got growth factors. So it can transmit nutrients, it can transmit, you know, biochemical information, it can transmit growth factors. There are receptors that perceive, uh, that can actually in, get information from the fluid, okay? We also know that there's receptors that, that perceive light. There's receptors that re perceive movement of the fluid. So now we're looking at light in the fluid and we're also looking at pulsations, okay? So some sort of resonance or flow within the fluid. So those, those receptors are essentially, you know, those receptors have been found on vertebrates and invertebrates of the the um, the inside of the of the ventricles that is actually bathing the cerebrospinal that is that is in contact with the cerebrospinal fluid. So if if it's already doing that, right, then what else could it actually be doing as a as a fluid medium? Well, you know, in pain management, for instance, we put uh, these spinal cord stimulators into people's backs. And what, you know, one of the ways is actually, well, what are you doing? Well, you're putting the, you're putting this, the, the electrical, you know, these electrodes onto the person's spine to try to change the impulses that, that are actually going to the spine so that we scramble the information that's coming up to the brain. But we know that if those, if those electrodes are actually in the fluid, that the fluid can actually transmit electricity super fast. If those electrodes get actually implanted in the spinal cord, now we actually have tissue that is semi-impeding. You still get a, you still get some transmission, but it's semi-impeding the transmission of these electrical currents. Right. So, so in looking at some of Dr. Pollack's work of the fourth phase of water, for instance, that there can be certain uh, there can be certain environments that water can go into a fourth phase. And what that fourth phase is, is essentially it creates sort of an exclusion zone of positive and negative ions in the water itself. And it sort of becomes this sort of crystalline matrix of water. And in that, essentially what you've done is anytime you, you make a positive and negative zone, now you create, now you can create an area where electrons can, can move. And anytime you create an, an area where electrons can move, you're sort of creating an internal, you can create an internal battery source. And so, you know, there's, there, 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 there's a lot of hypotheses in terms of, okay, cerebrospinal fluid can not only transmit information from hormones, growth factors, right, chemicals or nutrients that are, trans, that are, trans, that are put into the fluid itself, can not only transmit information from light, photoreceptors, things like that, can not only transmit information from movement, sound, vibrations, et cetera, et cetera, some sort of resonance. But maybe the cerebrospinal fluid can actually go into a fourth phase depending on certain conditions. Maybe it's the actual resonance of the fluid itself that it can actually go into a fourth phase of water. If it goes into a fourth phase of water, then do we have an internal battery that creates actually like an internal energy source? Right. And, and, and when you see these pictures, just like you've alluded to, you know, from ancients, you see them, they're sort of internally illuminated. And, and, and so, and so the question is, you know, does the cerebrospinal fluid, can it go into this fourth phase and can it actually generate, can it actually create this internal source of, of energy of light, literally light of like, here's this internal battery and the body is the circuit. And now now we are illuminated, right, based on whatever, you know, practice or resonance with the fluid that we're doing, um, that we are actually illuminated. And from that now, if there is 
this connection to another uh, uh, just source energy or some sort of cosmic energy, right? How would that energy, if it's coming into the body, and this is another hypothesis, where would it, what's the least differentiated, most sort of quick way of getting that information to the entire body as a whole? Well, it could be through this fluid. Um, and so that's why I sort of see it as a bridge in essence, um, that once we develop through introspection, once we develop that perception of the fluid, bring awareness to it, have a relationship with it, now we can actually sort of come to a phase of almost de-differentiation and now have a relationship with more subtle energy uh, forms. And, um, and, and that, and that, and that the connection is through the fluid and that there's this sort of, maybe the cerebrospinal fluid actually has a memory, that there's some sort of energetic memory within the cerebrospinal fluid, um, whether it's, you know, a pulse tile, uh, memory, um, whether it's an energetic memory that's held within the water and oxygen bonds, um, that, for instance, you know, because I mentioned earlier, I do talk about embryology, but your original cerebrospinal fluid was the amniotic fluid in your mother's womb. And so as that develops, the amniotic fluid becomes the cerebrospinal fluid. So any energetic memory that the amniotic fluid had is present in your cerebrospinal fluid in a homeopathic quantity so you still have like a, a a tiny amount who knows how tiny it is but you still have a tiny amount of that amniotic fluid from when you were not even from when you were like a single layer sheet in your cerebrospinal fluid right now from a homeopathic perspective from a purely energetic memory homeopathic perspective the dilution keeps on going and that's it that's present in all of us and so you know to kind of have then that relationship where it's like whoa okay the amniotic fluid when i was a single layer cell like a single celled layer sheet that energetic information from the amniotic fluid may still be present in the cerebrospinal fluid today so now you can actually so now there's actually a bridge going all the way back to you in the womb as an embryo um, and now talking about your instructions or intentions right imagine now going back to that through the fluid through the cerebrospinal fluid going all the way back and with loving intention now guides sort of a new if you had you know some sort of like traumatic birth or whatever may have been happening to 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 your mother and in, in you know when you were in womb or whatever like that actually going back to the amniotic fluid and just sort of sending love to that amniotic fluid the resonance of love to that amniotic fluid and see if that actually can shift the resonance in the cerebrospinal fluid for you today um, and it's through that connection of the of the fluid. So um, kind of a long answer, but I think it's necessary because I, I believe it's probably going to be um, a number of these. It's not just going to be one, right? It's going to be a, it's going to be, it's, it's such a, such an amazing complex fluid that it's going to have a, 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 a it's going to, it's going to have a multitude of these different properties um, that it is going to be able to transmit uh, information. Um, and so I'm kind of hoping that it's going to be all of them, to be honest with you, because you can sing, you can dance, um, you can move, you could be exposed to drum beats. Um, you know, you can do yoga, you can do breathing, uh, you can do a number of different, a number of different sort of techniques. And all of those would be affecting our fluid to some degree, uh, even humming, for instance, you know, uh, chanting, uh, how the resonance of the vocal cords is affecting the fluid in the spine in the cervical spine 
Um, so a number of kind of different things. And, you know, and as I said, even if none of this, it still is able to transmit information through just being a fluid and secreting growth factors and hormones and neurotransmitters into the fluid that then our, our brain are exposed to. So it sounds like even if you're a uh, kind of a, a rationalist physicalist, there's un, undeniable benefits here. Um, but let's say if you're into the more, you know, metaphysical things that were coming up for me, were like, wow, this could be a way to connect, reconnect with your divine blueprint. This could be a way to generate life force, um, you know, or, or convert this into life force. Um, and, and so many of these different ideas that you mentioned or hypotheses kind of all come together with so many of the ancient teachings that, um, boy, what an exciting, what an exciting time to begin to understand this in a more comprehensive way. Totally. And like you said, you know, bridging in the, the, the ancient teachings, um, whether it's through, uh, breath work or yoga or, you know, dance, um, or any of those things, um, with, with the, what we know, you know, it's just going to become, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's going to be a beautiful thing to be honest with you and how many teachers, how many sages in the past really had that, that, that interoception, that interoceptive perception that what, you know, it's sort of like they didn't need, right. It was sort of like, they didn't need all the research sort of confirming it. It's like, they, this is just what was for them. Right. And so that's something that I feel like, you know, really kind of like, Hey, like, good job. You know, like, let's get, let's try to get our world, our society back to that ability for that, that, that interoception quality so that we can be more authentic with, Hey, this is, this is my experience. I'm not making this up. You know what I mean? This is, this is what I feel inside. And I've done this work enough to be like, Oh, wow, this is what I'm noticing. And this is the felt, and this is the energetic quality that is, that is moving here. And this is the relationship that it's having. Um, and, and so, you know, when we go back to a lot of these, yes, absolutely. Spot on. Um, you know, the divine blueprint, um, internal, internal activation of energy, um, connection with anything, you know, connection with source, connection with consciousness, connection with, you know, cosmic, you know, universal energy, whatever you want to call it, um, sort of all of the above. And that's what I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it, it actually presents an interesting explanatory mechanism for, um, you know, connecting for non-local information outside the field, right? Doing it through, I think there's this perception of kind of having a radio come online um, when you uh, do ample spiritual work and purification that you can kind of tune into information outside of things that you've experienced. But one thing I never considered before this conversation is that perhaps the way to do that is that the information is actually being transferred in the fluid. Um, the inform the fluid holds the information of all time because it's a hologram um, that contains the totality. And so, yeah, that's that's go. cool, man. Different, you know. <laughs> we don't know what we don't know these things, but they're fun to think about, right? Oh, it's super fun to think about. And you know what? I, you know. Um, if you do have any sort of spiritual practice, meditation practice, you know, guided intro spectrum practice or anything like that, like try it out. That's right. Right. Like go in it with love and kindness and curiosity for yourself. Um, and, you know, be your N of one is what I say. And, and, you know, if, let's, let's generate 1000 N of ones. And now we have a, a, a an N of a thousand. Um, such so, such good advice. And it, you know, it so much of what you said today reminds me of a lot of different um, concepts like parts work, internal family systems, where people are speaking to 
you know, this, this part of their, of their, um, this emotion. And, you know, what you're talking about is you can do that to your body too, which, which I completely agree with. And I've experienced firsthand. And, you know, if you talk to Richard Schwartz, you just say, hey, just, just try it and see what happens. Right. And right. you'd be surprised. And yeah, I would absolutely encourage people to do that with their inner, their inner body and their inner space. And it's amazing to hear that you have specific programs that help people with that. I know you've written some books. And so, you know, Mara, if people want to learn more about maybe going deeper here, supporting the things that you're doing, you know, please share, share where we can kind of get some more of this. Yeah. So, um, my email is on my website. It's a uh, holdingspace.com. Um, I'm trying to generate, uh, stories, uh, sort of anecdotes of people being able to sense their cerebrospinal fluid. So, you know, even sending in, even sending in a story and just sort of having, um, a repository there of stories that other people can read and can relate with. Many people have expressed just you know, just how grateful and thankful they are for just this, you know, putting it into a more of an anatomic scientific perspective, and yet how the anatomy and science really, really, truly resonated with their uh, authentic experience and how it helped to, uh, to clarify it for them. And so, you know, that, that that's really important. Um, you could send me an email, um, which is holdingspace18 at gmail.com. Um, I've done some programs that I've put on YouTube through the Emerging Sciences Foundation, which are um, Awakening Awareness. And so that kind of takes one from like the very basics of just having like a mindfulness practice, to be honest with you, is like, look, if a sensation or emotion arises, you know, what do you do with it? And and just sort of guiding people through um, you know, a basic of a mindfulness practice all the way to uh, a guided a guided meditation on the cerebrospinal fluid with the activation of the perineal floor, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, that, that that's really, you know, that's really, that's really it. Um, and I do recommend, you know, some sort of, some sort of introspective practice. That's awesome. Well, I will, I will track those um, awakening awareness presentations down and we'll link those in the show notes. And, um, you know, just want to, just want to thank you, Mauro. It's, it's amazing. Some of the work that you've done and the, the way that you've been able to kind of distill and clarify what's actually happening, uh, with this amazing substance in our body. And it's just going to be exciting to keep on watching it unfold. And so we're, we're grateful for you, man. Yeah, thank you. You're absolutely spot on. All right. Well, we'll see everybody on the next episode. Thank you so much. I